Should we go ahead and get started? Get out of the way. Good morning. My name is Carol Merrill, and I'm the secretary of the Laramie County Community College Trustees. Welcome to our public forum, Barry Doll. Brenda Little, our chairman, regrets not being here at this time. She had some work to do with the legislature, but she will be joining us soon. Wyoming law states that a community college board shall appoint a chief administrative office of the community college. And this board takes that responsibility very solemnly. We want to appoint a person who is best for this college, its students, faculty, and staff and our community. In order to do the best job we can, we need you. We need you to help us. If you have a question that you would like to ask the candidate, please write out the question on the 3 by 5 cards that are available at our doorways or from forum moderator Dave here. After you have written out your question, please give your card to Dave, who is in the back. Dave will ask your question for you. The board is asking that all questions be written out and presented by Dave so that we can make sure all questions to our candidates are legally proper. It also helps Dave with the time effectiveness of these forums. This public forum is scheduled to last one hour. During that hour, we'd like to listen to the candidates' responses to our questions, your questions, and score them accordingly to the score sheet you received. The score sheets contain the names of all six candidates. Please continue to use the same sheet until all six candidates have been interviewed or you have been present at the last interview that you can attend. You may write comments on the back and we hope you do. When you have completed your sheet with as many candidates as you can, please t turn your sheet into trustees Ed Mosier John Kaiser, Brenda Little, Greg Thomas is here now, back in the back, and I think I skipped somebody, Kevin Kilty, and myself. We will collect all the score sheets from the public and include them in our analysis of the candidate scores. You can put your name on the score sheet or not. It is your choice. The Board of Trustees will tabulate the score sheets. We will discuss the results at the executive session on Wednesday, February 2nd. At, after that date, all of the score sheets and question cards will be available for public access. The board will review the scores from the public. However, please know that the final decision of the appointment of the college president belongs with the elected board of trustees. This public forum will last one hour. Dave, please begin. Good morning. Good morning. Your first question is, you stated that you started out as a teacher. What did you teach, and specifically, what administrative positions did you hold? Good, thanks. And before I start the answer, I'd just like to say that uh, thank you for, for having me here today. It's my pleasure, and I would uh, like to have the opportunity to get to know some of you a little bit better. I'm not sure if we're going to have that chance right at this minute. But, um, okay, so teaching. Well, yeah, when I first started teaching, it was actually right here in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, it's not probably the type of teaching most of you are thinking about, but it was my first experience in a teacher-student type of relationship as a teacher anyway. And I enjoyed it immensely. That was actually teaching tennis lessons. I, uh, I ran, back in the day, there was a tennis club at the hitching post, of course. Back in the day, there was a hitching post. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I ran that tennis club for eight summers. So I taught lessons and ran tennis tournaments and all that sort of thing. And while I, when I first started teaching tennis lessons, it somehow, I, and almost a conscious thought on my part is how much I enjoyed that relationship, that teacher-student relationship. I still didn't have any plans to go into education. In fact, I thought maybe I'd just do, a, do that for the, my entire life. Um, but that wasn't probably um, in the cards, and, and it clearly wasn't. 
And so uh, when I went to Arizona State University, uh, first I did, I did start at UW for a little while, but then I transferred down where I could play tennis in the wintertime at uh, Arizona State. And I got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in accounting. And when I was getting my master's degree in accounting, they needed somebody to teach some introductory level courses. They'd actually never had a master's student teach before. They had 20 PhD students who were teaching courses, but they didn't have enough, apparently. And so they asked me if I wanted to teach some introductory accounting courses, which took me totally by surprise. It was not even at that point the career path that I had in mind. I was going to go to work for corporate America and, and uh, do something. I don't know now. But um, so they gave me the opportunity to go in the classroom and teach these introductory accounting courses. And um, I loved it from day one. And before long, I knew that's what I wanted to do. In fact, I delayed finishing my master's degree. I slowed down so I could keep teaching. Because as long as I was in the master's program, they were going to keep offering me teaching jobs. And I thought, well, as soon as I graduate, then that goes away. Turns out it didn't. It turns out they hired me full time. So I probably should have gone ahead and done that a little quicker. But um, they, had, they had me teach uh, full load. And then I uh, took jobs teaching accounting at a couple other universities, one in Florida, and uh, also spent a short time in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And then I settled up in Duluth, Minnesota, and taught accounting at the University of Minnesota Duluth. I taught there for six more years. And then I took a little time off. I uh, left higher ed for a couple of years and ran my own business. And um, then the opportunity to teach accounting at the community college came open, and that was 1995. It's Lake Superior College in Duluth. And um, quite frankly, I had never had an experience on a community college, except playing tennis on the tennis courts out here at LCCC back in the mid-70s. That was my community college experience at the time. And most of those universities are large universities, research universities. And uh, so that was my experience in higher ed. And then I went to a relatively small, a little smaller than Laramie County, relatively small community college. And uh, I remember very well teaching my first accounting courses there. The first week, I thought that this is just not going to work. That I felt like fish out of water. This was so different than what I was used to. And they were on the quarter system then. But I also remember that before the end of that first quarter, I knew there was no other place I wanted to be. Because teaching those students at the community college was so different, and that means so much better than teaching the students at the big universities. And so um, I'm, I've completed 15 years of employment there. Six of those were accounting faculty. And then in 2001, I became the academic dean of a few, of a few programs as well as the distance learning offerings. And then in, I don't know what year, I'm going to say 2005-ish, uh, that position was, was uh, promoted from dean to vice president. So I've been an administrator for nine years, primarily responsible for things related to technology, but not solely. Given that this is a temporary interim position, why are you interested in this position? Well, I'm kind of curious about that myself. Um, I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out who was correct, Dorothy Gale or Thomas Wolfe. Now, now, Dorothy said there's no place like home. There's no place like home. Thomas Wolfe said, you can't go home again. Um, the truth might be somewhere in between. I don't, I don't know. But uh, I was one of those who, when I graduated from high school, and that was Cheyenne East. Mid anybody here uh, go to East High in the mid-70s? You did? Do you know who I am? <laughs> Am I supposed to know who you are? So I'm afraid of that. Well, see, I, I entered the witness protection program by changing my last name, and that I thought would get me off the hook. Apparently not, huh? No, I, just just for clarity's purpose, I did um, change my name when I got married. So growing up, and my family is still in the region here, the last name is Nab, so my name is Barry Nab for the first 39 years of my life. And now I put that in the middle, and I use my wife's um, family name of Dahl. Most people who've met me in the last 15 years know me as Barry Dahl. And if you said Barry Nab, they wouldn't have any idea who you're talking about, and vice versa. <laughs> people from before, they hear Barry Dahl, and they say, I have no idea who that person is. OK, so 
At any rate, I was one of those that after high school, I, uh, I got out of town. And uh, although my family has lived here throughout since 1966, I was, I was born in Torrington. And then in 66, my dad worked for the Postal Service and was transferred from the Torrington Post Office to the Cheyenne Post Office. And uh, so I went to a couple of elementary schools, I went to Cary Junior High, and then East High, before that other trek I already talked about, going through college and teaching. Um, so, temporary position. First of all, I, uh, I've known about Laramie County Community College from its inception. I lived here. I was uh, junior high, I think, when, uh, when the college was formed. And I've uh, kept up over the years. You know several people who have worked here over the years. Um, a very good family friend is, is uh, Dick Williams, Richard Williams, former dean here. And um, so he would always kind of keep me up on the latest news of, of the college. And uh, we got to, I've got to know a few other people. I see Sarah in the audience. Sarah and I met over in Asia on an international student trip. And uh, Debbie Major used to work here. She and I both have served on the ITC Board of Directors. I know her husband will be here later today. They're, they are fine people. Um, and so it may be an interim position, but it's also home. And uh, I've, I've had an interest in Laramie County Community College for as long as it's been in existence. And uh, I am pretty well aware of some of the trials and tribulations that uh, have probably brought us to this point here today. And uh, you know, I, I look at myself as somebody who can, who can make a difference in a positive way. And so I will also tell you, and I'll be perfectly honest with you, that I'm very attracted to the fact that it's an interim position. Because I'm not sure that this is how I want to spend the rest of my career. I would like to find that out. I've thought this is how I'd like to spend the rest of my career, but um, being a college president is no day at the beach. And so um, an interim presidency right now is extremely attractive to me. I, I may not have applied if right away it was the permanent position here. I'm not sure I would have been ready for that, but uh, I feel ready for this. What approach will you take to interact and be involved with the student body? Well, um, I think it's extremely important for the college president to be um, very open and available to the student body, not only the, the officers of student government, but to basically any student. I, um, you, know, you have to just be a little bit careful with that because then sometimes students think that you're the, you're the first line of defense when they have a complaint or something, and, and that can't work that way. But um, I, I look at more of being involved in campus events, I, I like to attend events. Um, the college in Minnesota has one sports team. Uh, you probably never guess what it is. Well, maybe you will try. No, there's hockey all over the place, but no, it's too expensive for us to have a hockey team. Curling. And the reason there's a curling team, or one of the reasons there's a curling team, is a couple of Olympic curlers have gone to this college. I'm like, well, gee, if they keep coming, won't we have a great team? Um, but it is, a, it is a pretty big sport up there. It's not a very expensive sport to have. It's the first dalliance into that. But I, I do enjoy athletics, and so um, I, would, I would attend basketball games. I would, I would go to sporting events. I'd go to the, to the other college events, plays, and, and that sort of thing. I think being present in those things not just so you're present, but to be there and be part of the community goes a long way towards letting students know that you're, you're here for them. Um, one thing that I've done sometimes at, at the college but not been able to do all the time is uh, just to have kind of informal setting. You know, if, if the students see you sitting in the cafeteria and know that you're open for them to come and sit down and chat, after a while, they will. Usually not right away. <laughs> it's kind of like, ooh, this looks too scary, or I don't know what he's up to, or something like that. But after they get to know you, they will. Um, and so I think that those kind of informal uh, opportunities to, to meet with students are really important for the students, but also for the administrators. You may have heard the Board of Trustees has ordered an organizational audit. Please provide your views and comments on implementing organizational restructuring. How would you handle the tough personnel decisions that are recommended from the audit? Well, I don't know anything about those types of things. Reorganization and tough personnel issues. 
Um, well, okay, so for those of you who don't know, I know a fair amount about it because I'm in the middle of that myself right now. Uh, new president at Lake Spear College came in July 1st, and uh, we are in the midst of reorganization. And that reorganization uh, had my name on phase one, along with a couple of other vice presidents. And as of March 15th, we will no longer have a paycheck or benefits or anything else as the administration is being downsized pretty dramatically. It's a savings of about half a million dollars per year with uh, four vice president positions being eliminated from the college. And that's another reason why I'm here in front of you today. But um, that reorganization is, first of all, I would say that I don't think there's any one way to do it. There's never the, act of the easy answer. There's not a plan that will work in all different situations. And so for me, it's really a question of, of right sizing, but also what I would call right balancing. It's not just do you have enough people available to do work. It is are they doing the right work? Are you as a college continuing to do the right things, the things that need to be done, the things that add value? And I've seen several examples where um, you know, in my opinion, we were cutting a position that added fabulous value and possibly not cutting a position that might not be making that much of a difference in the lives of students or employees or whatever they were intended to make a difference in. Um, that's a tough call. I mean, that's, it's an opinion more than anything. It's hard to really gather hard data on much of those types of things. But um, you do have to make those types of calls. Reorganization does give you an opportunity to, to uh, address inefficiencies. When co colleges are like lots of organizations that when they go through growth, and sometimes fairly rapid growth, inefficiencies occur. And it, it's, it's pretty easy. And then you come into that, uh, well, we've always done that way. We've always had that position. Like, well, things change over time. And we have to take a look at whether that needs to change as well. I will tell you that the reorganization that's affecting me personally, uh, if I had been the new president at the college, I would have done a reorganization too. I don't think I would have done it exactly the same way. In fact, I know I wouldn't have done it exactly the same way. But I can't tell you necessarily exactly what I would have done, but I would have done something. We were too top heavy. There was an opportunity to apply resources in different ways. Um, and so I think that that's, that's something that, you know, tough times call for tough decisions. How do you build trust within the institution? Well, building trust to me means that you are honest and forthright with the people that you deal with, whether it's fellow employees, whether it's people in the community, or whatever. I, I see that you, uh, you have an action project, an equip action project on um, communication, accountability, and transparency. And those three particular terms, and I'll throw a fourth one in a minute, are very important to me as well. Now, the accountability and transparency thing, you know, you can dismiss that as just being buzzwords. They're kind of the latest buzzwords in higher ed. Everybody talks about transparency, but they aren't transparent. Everybody talks about being accountable, but doesn't hold anybody accountable, including themselves. You know, so those words have to be a lot more than just words. And I personally believe that they are to me. Um, I will be the first one to call bull on somebody if that's what I think they're doing. Uh, the, so I said I was throwing a fourth word. Along with transparency and accountability in particular, I think that if I can steal from Stephen Colbert, we really need a dose of truthiness in there as well. Because I've seen, I can show you examples of, air quotes, transparency. Well, we're being transparent. Here's the information. Well, guess what? That information is not, ac not accurate. Or it's not complete. I'll give you an example. This is one I've actually harped on a couple times. So if anybody's back in Minnesota watching this, uh, it probably won't surprise them <laughs> too much. Um, We've used various different student surveys for various purposes and satisfaction surveys and that sort of thing. <coughs> Noel Levitz makes a couple of uh, very useful surveys and we use them. And uh, when, you, when you get the results from a Noel Levitz survey though, you get results that in my opinion 
can be very misleading. The data itself is what it is, but the interpretation of that data, to me, is where you know, the rubber meets the road. Nice cliche. Uh, so in these surveys, they look at your data, they compare your data with usually national data, but it could be a, a smaller group of peer institutions or that sort of thing, and they give you differences between your data and the baseline, and they tell you about you know, whether you're above or below, and if you're above or below, by how much, in particular whether it's statistically significant or not. You, know, you might be a couple of little points above in satisfaction, but that could be random equity. But if you're significantly above, then the chances of being error are very slim. So you get this list, and what they do then is they categorize these different topics. So students have answered these, they're not really questions, but they're statements. They say how important something is and how satisfied they are. And then you get through reports, and they talk about strengths and weaknesses. Sounds good, right? Strengths, those things were done good. Weaknesses, things we're not doing so well with. And so then the system puts out this report and says, here are our strengths. Boom, 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 boom. List of five, six, seven, whatever. Came right off the no lecture report. These are our strengths as a system according to our students. Well, here's the problem. If you just provide that information to people, they believe that those things you're doing very well on. Because what else does strength mean? Well, what they don't tell you is that those are what I call internal strengths or relative strengths. In other words, given all the things students asked about, these are the things that are at the top. Doesn't mean they were at the top compared to the baseline, and like the national average. And in fact, the data that I could point you to right now that says strengths on it, every one of those measures is below the national average. They don't tell you that. So they're being transparent, because here's the report, here's the information. We have these strengths. And when I say, yes, but those strengths are below the national average, they're, well, don't say that. Well, it's true. So bringing the truth into the matter goes a long way, as far as I'm concerned. And if you do that, then you can have true transparency. You can be accountable, whether it's good or bad. I'll, I'll finish this and get to the next question just by, <clears throat> I'm going to ask a question that you don't have to answer. But I've been down this road a few times, so I, I, I have my own answer already. I was looking at the systems portfolio for the college online. and. Um, I've written parts of the systems portfolio for Lake Spirit College as well. And so my question to you is, is everything in that systems portfolio true? If I read that systems portfolio, am I learning anything that's not accurate about Lake Laramie County Community College? I'm going to guess that unless you're the one college out there, that yes, there are things in there that are not either accurate or complete or true. I think that's wrong. I think we can do better than that. If, if the data doesn't look too good, do you hide it or do you make it look better? Do you take action? Do you make, take steps to improve whatever it is, student retention or whatever the case may be? I'd rather say, this is where we are now, but we're going to try to get better, as opposed to, well, we're not going to tell you where we are right now because it doesn't look very good. And that kind of thing happens all the time. I don't know if I answered that question, but let's move on. It's an AQUIP question. <laughs> Discuss your familiarity with the AQUIP process. Well, um, AQUIP, the Academic Quality Improvement Project, that is um, something I'm very familiar with. Lake Spirit College uh, became an AQUIP school back in 2001. Now, AQIP started in 1999, but very few schools jumped on board right away. So that was, it was April of 2001, so it was about a two-year-old project at the time. So we were one of the early adopters of AQIP. Um, so over 10 years now, almost, almost 10 years, I've been a part of the AQIP team. I've uh, been the sponsor or kind of the person responsible for a couple of our action projects. One I would say was fairly successful, and one I would say was not terribly successful. Our first uh, first try at action projects, we we didn't really know what we were doing, and uh, we bit off a lot more than we could chew. I'll give you, I'll tell you about the project that I was one of the co-sponsors on. That was our first go-round with AQIP. It was a data 
inventory project. We wanted to create kind of this inventory of all the data related to the college and any other data, which sometimes comes from outside the college, that people need to do their jobs. And that sounds really good and important. And oh my gosh, is it this mushroom cloud of stuff that continues to grow and grow and grow. And about two years into this action project, we had lost so much momentum, and we had just, we just knew that this was an insurmountable task. And so we changed the goal um, to categorizing the data in one little area, and then we were done. Um, <laughs> and so, and we've had a couple other examples like that in the ACO process of, you know, you need an action project that is doable, that has, uh, that you'll be able to get buy-in in, and that you can get to a completion point relatively quickly. And, you know, that's usually about a year or less. And so I still see projects that are scheduled to last two or three years. And trying to keep that momentum up is really hard. The other thing, I mentioned your systems portfolio. I've, I've uh, written chapters for our own systems por portfolio. Um, every word in those chapters was totally true. But uh, so I, I'm very familiar with the process. I actually do support the process. We went through growing pains, and I think most schools do. I don't know where, if you are yet. Um, you've been, almost four, three and a half years or something, I think. 2006, I think, um, or seven, whatever. Um, at any rate, we went through some growing pains with AQIP where we didn't really quite get it. It wasn't necessarily paying off. It was just, it was different, but not better than uh, the old approach to accreditation. Uh, now, most people on campus would, would not agree with that statement anymore. That once we kind of figured out how to make progress with that, um, I will tell you that one of the other vice presidents who's just been eliminated was the person in charge of AQIP and all of our institutional research and stuff. So I don't know going forward how that's going to work, but it has worked pretty well the last. Well, we've been in AQIP school for 10 years. I'd say we had five bumpy years and five pretty good years. What would you do as interim president to increase the morale on campus and improve the image of LCCC in the public? Well, I know that this is a, this is a, a serious issue for, for many people on campus and within the community. And um, I think as an interim president, there are things that you can do to, to, to start making changes in, in those areas. And in fact, I think that that's probably the, maybe the most appropriate types of things for an interim president to concentrate on. Kind of the small victories, the, the things that you can make some progress on to address some kind of lingering issues that, that may be there, as opposed to trying to start new initiatives and you know we're gonna be the next greatest thing doing this type of thing. Um, I think part of that has to do with, with what I've already talked about with, as far as with, with employees and with students is, um, I'm not sure, sometimes student morale is not affected the same way employee morale is, although it tends to seep in after a while. So I'm not quite sure where you are on the seepage stage. I'll, I'll ask Alex about that. Right? But, um, but at any rate, the, uh, uh, now I totally forgot where I was going with that, but it'll come back to me in a second. The, uh, what was I saying, Carol? <laughs> Test. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the question was, again, this will get me on track if you help me out. Um, Dale. Oh yeah, the small, okay, the things to, that you can do. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but as, as an interim president, I think you can make a difference in some of those things. And so you celebrate some of the successes of the campus. Typically when morale goes down, all you hear are bad things. You, you know, people have issues that they need to uh, uh, air and maybe be addressed. But there are things to celebrate, things that are going well. Um, it's a good time to do some of that data analysis that I was talking about. You, know, you might very well find out that there are things that, that you need to address that can, that can improve operations, but you also then might find out, well, guess what? Things are going better in this area than what maybe the conventional wisdom might be. Um, and I think just really having open lines of communication, which to me is, is really important. You, you might already get a flavor of, you know, I am willing to tell you what's on my mind, and I think that's important, and that if you can't have a true dialogue, why bother at all? And so, um, you know, morale would be everybody's job, 
But I don't think anybody really enjoys being around a negative workplace. And so given the opportunity to, to pick things up a little bit, I, you know, do you have any fun? Are you having any fun at all? If you are, great, we can build on that. If you aren't, we need to start. You know, that's important. Over the past five years, enrollment at LCCC has grown by 15%. In several areas, including instruction, the number of employees has not kept pace. What strategies would you use to address this issue? Well, when I couldn't sleep at about 4 in the morning, I was looking at your enrollment numbers. <laughs> Seriously, I was. And um, so 15% over five years. My first thought is that's actually not that much. Um, and I just mean on a percentage basis, the way two-year schools have been going, the, that's, that's pretty reasonable growth, manageable. It should be manageable growth. All right, now having said that, I will tell you that in your systems portfolio, the enrollment chart that I looked at at 4 o'clock in the morning showed 50% growth in one year. It showed from the academic year 08 to the academic year 09, it showed right around 15 or 16% growth in duplicated enrollments duplicated headcount, which would be number of enrollments. So, um, so I might, you know, my, I'm first going to push back a little bit on the question, is it true that there were 15% over five years, or is the number something different? But then I'll say that regardless of what that number is, in, that, in a question like that, there's kind of an implied, um, well, there's an assumption that because enrollment grew 15 or whatever percent, that things such as the employee base should grow similarly. That then is the assumption that, well, we were right-sized five years ago. We had the right staffing five years ago. Now we've grown, we no longer have the right staffing. Well, I'm not gonna buy that. I would like to look into it. I would like to check to see whether that would be the case, that you were right-sized and you're not keeping up. I will tell you that the first glance at the data this morning, and I'd already had two cups of coffee, so I was, I was seeing the numbers correctly. Um, don't bear that out. Now again, this was only the one year, the 08 to 09 change. I don't know how many of you have looked at that data, but that enrollment growth of 15 or 16 percent happened with fewer sections of courses being offered. And in fact, when I first looked at the 08 data, I was kind of taken back because the uh, number of students, the number of seats sold per section were just over 12. I'm thinking 12 students per section, per course section? That's really low. Then in the next year, the per, I can't remember the exact number, but it's closer to 15 students per course section. Far more efficient. So coming back to the question of our enrollment grew 15%, why, isn't our, why aren't our employees' base growing 15%? I would argue, well, maybe it didn't need to. If there are some inefficiencies, and it certainly appeared at a 12 to 1 student to uh, course section ratio, that there are a lot of open seats, you have the capacity to grow your enrollment, at least in some respects. Keep in mind that things like grow enrollment does put a bigger strain on advising and certain things like that doesn't necessarily put as much of an additional strain on some of the other functions that you do. And so there's not an easy answer to those questions. But I will tell you that um, that's a very common situation that people say, well, this has grown by X, and so you know, now what? Like, well, let's find out why. Let's find out what's behind those numbers, because the numbers themselves might not tell you what uh, you're really interested in. How do you view the role of educational services staff, non-administrators, and non-faculty in the decision-making process? What's your role? <laughs> you are in this group. What's your name? Sherry what? What year did you graduate? Dang. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so Sherry sitting there, um, is in this category of employment that you're talking about. And uh, to me, that's the whole purpose of shared governance, is so that everybody has a voice, so that there's 
the different, regardless of which group you get categorized in, and that always kind of bugs me, you know, we have to put people in groups and labels and stuff, but we do, so, so I guess we'll deal with that. But the uh, staff people that fall into that category, oftentimes, and by oftentimes I mean at schools I'm familiar with, don't have much of a voice, because faculty have a big voice, and they should. Students should have a big voice, and sometimes they do, oftentimes they don't. And sometimes the non-instructional, non-administrative staff are kind of left out there, you know? And I hate to use this, but it feels like, you know, they're the mortar they're, they're, uh, in between the bricks. And it's like, well, guess what? That's a very important part of the whole picture, too. And so, if you have true shared governance that gives all of the different groups a voice, that doesn't mean that they make all the decisions, because that is what the administration and or the board of trustees are either appointed or elected to do. There, the, lots of the decision has to come from that, but not all of it. But having input, having their voice actually heard. And I've seen it um, all across the board. I've seen where it's pure lip service to whether there's a voice, and I've seen where there is a real opportunity to share your expertise. And I mentioned in the earlier session, for those in there, uh, the people doing the job have the best information about that job. And if they are not allowed to share their experiences, to tell you their concerns, to give input into the decision-making process, then you have missed the best source of information for that particular thing. And so they need to be at the table. When online learning was growing quickly and your faculty members were feel fearful for their jobs, how did you alleviate their fears? I did talk about this in the first one, so you can watch the tape later on and, and get your answer for that. Um, well, actually the answer, and I, I don't know if I'll say it exactly the same way as I did an hour ago, but the, um, you actually, we didn't, and, and this was something I was directly responsible for, it was growing online learning and dealing with these types of faculty concerns, and it wasn't just faculty -led concerns, about whether online learning was even something the college should be doing at all. But um, I did have to deal with that, and, and you don't alleviate their concerns right away. We didn't alleviate their concerns right away. The naysayers were still naysayers. I could talk to them, I could give them you know, my perspective, I could show them things that were happening in other places that may have been a couple of years ahead of the curve, and that's about all they were, was maybe a couple. But still, that doesn't, you know, that's, that's not lip service as I might for. They don't know whether they should believe you or not, and they're fearful for their job. And that was the case at my college. Uh, online learning today is about 29% of the total enrollment, and it makes about 35% of the total tuition revenue comes from online courses, because we do charge a higher rate for online. And so that growth has been really important to the well-being of the college. And today, most people you know, have the buy-in, know that it has been a good thing for the college and for our students. But it was getting to that point. And it was, I, I will tell you that there are, there are a couple of things. One is, I, I do share a lot of information. Um, whether it's on websites or, or in presentations or whatever. So as we gathered evidence of the fact that online students were learning, that they were satisfied, that all of the various pieces that people were concerned about, sharing that information out there did help. The other thing, though, that helped a lot, and I know I don't have time for the whole story, but another thing that helped a lot had to do with a uh, faculty-driven process. Some of you, if you're, if you're familiar with online learning, you might know a little bit about a project it started back in 2004, 2003 really, uh, called Quality Matters. It came out of Maryland Online. It was a FIPSI grant. And they, in the 2003-2004 academic year, was the first year of this FIPSI grant. I went to the ITC conference, my first time ever going to the ITC conference, and they were doing a half-day workshop, which I signed up for, because it had to do about quality of online courses. I thought, well, I want to see what this is all about. During that workshop, they said, well, you know, this is a FIPSI grant, and that means we have to share. And so here's, we, they developed their version one of a rubric, a rubric of course design principles for online courses, and said, so if any of you signed up for the workshop, if any of you want to take this rubric home and use it, change it, do whatever you want, 
go for it. And I said, well, I will. And that's exactly what I did. Brought it back, and in the first year, so it was really the 2005 academic year, uh, five faculty members and myself worked kind of as a team, as a task force, to revise that rubric, make it make more sense to us than the original Maryland one did. Lots of good stuff in it, but not everything worked for us. So we did some revisions. That was year one, and we tested it. The faculty members were reviewing each other's courses and that sort of thing. And starting in year two, and this was now like five years ago or so, I got out of the way. I said, here's the deal. We have a process in place where faculty members do peer review for other faculty. We have a rubric that we are comfortable with that looks at design of courses, and that's all it looks at is how they're designed, not how well they're taught or whether the students are learning, but it's one important factor. And I said, so this is gonna be a faculty-driven process. I'm not telling you how to do it, I'm not even telling you to do it, it'll be voluntary, and it's your own professional development opportunity, do with it as you will. We did get a little bit of release time, we still do, a couple of credits is all, to a faculty leader of this group. Well, in the last five or six years, that's been the best professional development thing we've done. But the other thing is that it's spilled out beyond just those who teach online. It didn't immediately, but the other ones who did teach online kept hearing about all this quality stuff that the online people were doing. And by the way, I think quality is kind of a creepy word when we're talking about education, but <laughs> it's also part of equip, so I guess we have to get used to it. Um, but it, it now there is also a peer review on ground faculty team that helps other faculty members do that sort of teaching. That grew out of them hearing constantly about all the good things the online people were doing. And as it started to grow, so that was one example, it was word of mouth, it was providing results, and before long, we had finally got over that. I want to tell you real quick, I can't see that clock, help me. And it goes to 10.30, right? Okay, um, I will just tell you that this was kind of the 2000, well, right when I became administrator is when we really started paying attention to this stuff. So about 2001 through 2005 was tremendous. We had 75% annual growth rate in online for five years. And we had new faculty coming in, we had, we had change. We talked about this in the previous one. But um, when it was all over with, and, and it's never over with, but when we kind of got past all the, all the fire and smoke, the, um, I did some, I would go to conferences and make presentations about what we did about the process to get through, to get over these hurdles. And the title of that presentation was How to Start a Civil War on Campus and How to End It. And uh, I, I like having a provocative title just because it drives some attendance to your session. But also the Chronicle picks up, picked up on that and did a full article about our growing pains in online learning and address you know, how we try to get other people on board. And that doesn't mean they had to teach online, that means that they stopped being fearful for what online was doing to the campus. What is your philosophy about offering remedial classes online? Um, if you go to my blog, which is barrydoll.com, it's one of my blogs anyway, um, you'll find some data there about that particular question. We have been teaching developmental courses online, um, well, seven or eight years now. If you go to my blog, it'll be right there. That's one reason I put some stuff on the blog so I can find it when I need the information as well. I can go in and say, oh yeah, our first developmental math course was 2003, and our first developmental writing was 2004, or whatever. And it tells you how many students have gone through these courses over time, and I think I looked at the last couple of years at how well they've done, only looking at kind of the easily available data not the only relevant data, but um, grades and completion of courses. And keep in mind that almost all of the faculty members who teach developmental courses on campus, or let me state it the other way, almost everybody who teaches online developmental courses also teach them on campus. Okay, so it's not like they're two separate faculty pools at all. And so comparing the grades, you know, how many students passed, how many failed, how many withdrew for the online development courses with the on-campus development courses, there's there's a lot of commonality there. I'm not comparing apples with oranges, I don't believe, anyway. And what you'll find is that the completion rates, those who successfully complete, and it doesn't matter if you're saying C or better or D or better, take your pick, 
is almost identical for the online developmental courses as they are for the on-campus. And the GPA is actually higher for the online students than for the on-campus. So more high grades with a few more either Fs or Ws, but when it all washes out, there's, there's almost no difference whatsoever. That doesn't mean it's always been that way, because we've been doing those for seven or eight years now. But it was a, it was a matter of faculty members also learning how to uh, teach developmental courses to a different audience. I'll tell you one other perspective. And I, <clears throat> in case you're interested, I, I tend to turn things around and look at them from the other angle more times than I don't. And so the argument against developmental courses online, if I go way back, well, you know, first of all, you just can't do it. That was the argument. Not possible. Students can't learn that way. And so turning it around a little bit, I said, okay, so let's see what, what we have with a developmental course, with developmental student, or a student needing a developmental course is a better way of saying that, is somebody who's completed their high school education, K-12, and come to the college underprepared. They can't read, write, or do math, whatever, at the college level, sometimes all three. So they've been 12 or 13 years in a system of sit and get, and this is where they are. This is, they're not prepared. So you're telling me that more of the same would be good for them. 13 years didn't get them up to this level, but if we just go another year or two of the same techniques, generally speaking, now, that would make no sense to me. Why do we think more of the same is going to provide different results? Is that for some of these students, a different approach might actually work. And I, you can't prove a whole lot of that, but I think for some, they will tell you that, that this worked for me and it didn't. Then you get others who say the exact opposite. And the other piece of that was we were trying to market our AA degree, really any of our online degrees, to distant students, not just those who could come to campus. And so that wouldn't work if we couldn't do developmental courses online. We would be stopping them from access to higher ed if we said, you can't do developmental online. Once you get through developmental, come on back and do all the rest of it. Um, it was just trying to make them succeed. What is your philosophy of promoting a fast-growing branch campus? What is my philosophy? Um, nihilism. <laughs> well, postmodernism would be better, maybe. I don't know. Uh, all right, so I'm going to get past the philosophy thing for a second. Fast growing branch, for promoting a fast growing branch campus. Okay, so if they're fast growing, why do they need to be promoted exactly? It sounds like maybe the promotion is already working pretty well because it's a fast. All right, I don't, I'm not sure where that question is supposed to lead me. I'll just tell you that a branch campus is your college. That, is, it's not like, well, we've got that other thing that we're doing. No, that's you. That's your face, maybe in a different community. I know you have the Albany County campus. That's probably what this is referring to. Um, that's Laramie County Community College. Of course, it's weird that that's in Henry's. Yes. Um, but um, you know, the E campus, where I come from, whatever you call your online learning here, you can view that as a branch campus if you want to. I don't know that the term means very much. But all of the things that you're doing as a college reflect on the college. Doesn't matter where it's located, doesn't matter who you're serving, doesn't matter if it's continuing ed instead of degree program students or whatever else, it's you. And so the branch campus needs to be promoted and resourced and everything else like everything else that you do that you want to succeed. And it sounds like it is succeeding. What is your style in dealing with employee personality conflicts? So I know if I give too many flip answers, but that's going to count against me here. Because <laughs> duck and cover sounds good to me right now. Um, well, yeah, I tell you what, I've, I've, I've experienced some employee personality. I've probably been in the conflict um, more times than I care to remember. But employee personality conflicts can be very difficult. Um, and I'm not talking, well, I wouldn't anyway talk about anyone in particular, but man, sometimes adults don't act very much like adults, you know? Um, so I will tell you that it's probably not in my top five strengths. That doesn't mean that, it, that I 
run from those types of conflicts or that sort of thing. But um, I think it helps if you're some sort of a trained psychologist. How many? I bet we've got a couple. Raise your hand. Anybody? Okay. Well, then we're all kind of up against it when it comes to this particular one. You know, so a little professional help might might uh, be useful, and I probably mean that more ways than one. But um, personality conflicts can be a cancer that can, that can cause problems. And um, you know, sometimes it is really an employee who is not um, serving the, the college well. If that's true, you have to document, 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 and, and before you can ever really take any action. Oftentimes, that's not the case. It's two people don't like each other. Yeah? Those people need to get over it and, and do their jobs and, and go home and find somebody else to like or something. Okay, don't score that particular answer. <laughs> NA, not applicable. <laughs> Why do you believe your experience, knowledge, and skills make you the best candidate for this position? Well, I don't. Um, in a couple of ways, I don't think that my, what was it, knowledge, experience, and skills make me, well, the problem, the word I'm having trouble with is best. Um, I always have trouble with that word. I don't care if we're talking about this question or uh, you know, another one of those buzzwords in higher ed, best or it's term, but best practices. But what are the best practices in this? What are the best practices in that? Especially when it's something relatively new. Now, again, online learning is where I have a lot of experience, and boy, people like to talk about best practices when it comes to that. And I always shake my head and say, you know, there's no such thing as best practices. We don't know. We, we haven't been doing this well, and we're not the best yet, and we may never be there. And I always tell them, and, and I'll change my term slightly just for this audience. I always say, every time somebody says best practices, I flip a little switch in my head. It says, convert best practices into practices that don't totally stink. <laughs> because that's probably what they mean. You know, I'm saying that this is a little bit better than something else, so it doesn't totally stink. Now, I don't think that's a best practice, but it's a practice that we can live with and that maybe we can still make better and do all that. So what makes me the best candidate? Um, you know, you've got six candidates, and on paper, I think they all look pretty good, which is great for you. Now, you're not hiring somebody based on what's on paper, so that's why we're doing this. Um, so I'll just try to sell myself briefly. One thing is that um, if, I, if I jump into this, it would be to make a difference. It would be with enthusiasm and gusto and um, not an afterthought sort of thing. I don't <laughs> like to fail. And so it is a case of, of working hard, of trying to, trying to make good things happen. Um, it's a whole lot more fun to, to get praise down the road somewhere than it is to get you know, slap on the hands or whatever it might be. And so, um, Okay, one, one other angle I'll take on the whole what makes me, you know, the one that doesn't totally stink, is um, <laughs> if I really think that I bring a, a different background than most educators do. Most educators have a particular area of expertise because that's what they've done most of their career. Whether that be, you know, a classroom instructor who moves into administration and has the academic side, you know, curriculum and stuff, has that down. Somebody who's worked in finance their entire career has the finance, the accounting, the budget stuff, pretty well done, at least you hope so. Somebody who's worked in technology. So you have all these things. Well, in my application materials, I talk about the fact that I bring all three of those things to the table. I have two accounting degrees, and I taught accounting for 17 years. So that's both the accounting, finance, and budgetary type knowledge, and the teaching for 17 years gives me the classroom experience. Been an academic administrator for 10 years, and that had full responsibility for the uses of technology on campus. Not just online learning that I've talked about a little bit, but other uses of technology throughout the campus. I know people who are the tech guys, and by the way, I, I lately get branded that way, which I don't like very much at all. You know, I don't consider myself to be the tech guy at all, but it's kind of where my job has been the last few years of concentrating on that. But I see tech guys, and they're good at that, and that's kind of what they do. And I see finance people, and they're good at that, and that's kind of what they do. And I see people with the academic knowledge, 
may not have much knowledge of these other things. Um, I think that's what I bring to the table. Have you ever been a president of an organization? I was a sole proprietor for a couple of years, <laughs> which means I was the president and the vice president and the, and the line staff. And uh, no, I have not been president of an organization to the best of my memory. As all colleges do, LCCC has some instructional programs with consistently low enrollment. As the interim president, what would you do to support and encourage growth in those programs? Okay. As an interim president, I think low enrollment programs is something that probably can be on the, the plate to look at. I will tell you that I don't um, start that look expecting or, or thinking any one thing, any one cause of low enrollment. Because uh, I've seen it many times. I will tell you that for a lot of people, their first and oftentimes their only guess or their only reason why there's low enrollment is they didn't promote it well enough. Can't get marketing to sell my program. Well, typically a college marketing program is not trying to sell each individual program that way. Um, and that, you know, that, that's open for debate, I guess. But I have seen cases where we said, okay, we've got a lot of money invested in this program and the enrollment's really low. And I'm telling you about an actual situation I'll just leave the program out of it. We did do some expensive, targeted advertising on that program. Because they had less than 10 suits in the program. It was a very expensive program. And this advertising paid off. Now it was expensive, so you have to question whether that was me because it was. Um, Thank you. Sorry. But it, don't worry. The, um, yeah. the cost of the advertising, you know, how much money do you put down that road and, and for how much return can you possibly get? I, I think yeah, I'm a cost benefit type of guy and you gotta look at that. But we did, we spent a lot of money and, and the we we took the program from about eight students in the class to twenty five in one year. And then the next year it was back below ten. And you say, oh, you stopped advertising. No, in fact, it was a two-year program. The students came, the students didn't stay. And there were some reasons for that that became especially obvious to us once we'd spent all this money and we actually had 25 students in the program, and then most of them left. We had a faculty member who didn't treat students very well. We had outdated curriculum that I guess we weren't totally aware of until it became perfectly obvious. I mean, there were huge reasons. We, so basically, we talk these students into coming to this great program only to give them a not so great program. So all of the different factors there, is there, is there still an employment market for this? Um, I will tell you that in the computer information systems area at my college, um, there's now actually a pretty good job market up where we are, I mean, considering the economy and all that. There's, there are jobs up there. We still can't get students to enroll. And it used to be that they were just beating down the door now again, it used to be, that's before the dot-com bust. But still, everybody thought, oh, I'm going to get a career in computers. Now there's actually jobs, and we are having a hard time getting enough students into the program. So there's never one answer or one reason as to why there's low enrollment programs. I think you really need to take a look at, at all those different factors. And, um, you know, once in a while, the solution is that there's not going to be any enrollment going forward. That concludes our open forum. All right, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.